Hello. Uh, well, that was a great talk and it's very difficult to be on the stage after such a great talk. But I'll still do my part. So first of all, who am I? I'm uh, Amit and I love everything which is free and open. <laughs> including software. I think that's the reason I'm here. So it is one of the free softwares I use a lot and uh, help developed a lot. So Simpy is, how many of you have heard of Simpy? Very decent, nice. Glad to hear that. For the people who are missing a lot in life, you check this. So this is a simple example of how, what Simpy does. It's a symbolic manipulation library in uh, Python. It's pure Python. So if you want to play with the symbolic stuff, like uh, let's say, uh, if you say 3.14, the value of pi is numeric, that is numeric. If you say like 22 by 7, that's symbolic. So if you want exact answers like these, so you can use SymPy. And also we have our own Zen as well, so you can play with it. You can try it in your browser if you don't want to install, uh, but it's, uh, you can install it as well, but it's just, uh, I guess, four or five megabytes. And uh, I think last year we released the version one, so we are quite stable now. Uh, have you heard of this Google Summer of Code? How many of you have heard of it? Amazing. So uh, students out there, so Google Summer of Code is a program which, uh, in which Google offers students stipends for working on open source. And it's a very good idea to work on uh, op open source projects at the comfort of your home and you'll get to learn a lot of things at a very early age. And it's only for university students. And we are also participating in uh, Google Summer of Code. And the deadline is 27 March. I work for a company called as Telegraph. Uh, it's a newspaper. Uh, I guess most of you know. And I'm not a journalist. So uh, if you want to have a sneak peek at the code using this talk, you can go to this repo and have a look at the code. So before uh, talking about Gil, so uh, other survey, how many of you have heard of Gil? Almost everyone. That's glad to hear. So let's uh, look at a like, uh, bit of primer before talking about Gil. So a process. It's simply an instance of a program in execution. And there's something called as thread as well. Thread is basically the smallest uh, sequence instructions in execution. So processes can be comprised of multiple threads, and threads is like the smallest sequence. Even, and if you are uh, working in terms of uh, programming language, you can have a larger thread as well. Maybe you can have, you can do a whole lot of things in a thread. So it depends on how you define it. So in computing, it's like a small, smaller sequence of uh, instructions. So uh, what's with thread? So thread uh, are lightweight and share memory. That's the main uh, uh, benefit of threads. So that's the strength of threads. Shared state, everyone has everything. And what's the weakness of thre uh, threads? State state. The worst part is simultaneously. So let's see what is multi-threading is. It's basically the ability of a central processing unit to uh, run multiple threads at concurrently. Uh, so one more thing, there's a lot of uh, misconception between concurrency and parallelism, so I'd like to clear that first. So concurrency is more of like cooperative multi-threading. So for example, like a thread is running and uh, it can it will wait and another thread will run. So this is called as cooperative multithreading, uh, cooperative uh, uh, sorry concurrency. And what parallelism means is like two threads exactly going at the same time, two or more. So it depends how many threads you spawn. So this is how multithreading th threading looks like in a single core machine. So if you have just one core, only one thread can run at a time. So thread one runs and this it stops and allows thread two to run, and then stops. Uh, thread two stops and thread one runs. So just a little example of how it looks in a single core. Why do we need multithreading at the first place? To keep process responsive. So if by any chance if you have used uh, Microsoft Word in like early 2000s, by the way, I'm not that old. I, I can rewind my school days, that's what I'm saying. So uh, if you used to uh, have the print command on those days in the Microsoft Word, uh, then the, uh, system, um, the system used to hang, if you could recall. That was due to that uh, the multi, uh, utilizing multi-cores was not that uh, evolved those days. 
So you have that I/O thing happening, but still you cannot do uh, CPU on stuff. So that was uh, the reason, one of the reasons, like why do we need multithreading? Keep a processor busy. Now you have got like a huge uh, 2.7 gigahertz processor, and you want to use it to full potential. Like uh, not a, not even a single second you want to want it to stop because you spent some bucks on it. Keep multiple processors. You have got like 36 cores, and you want to use all of them at the same time because why sit when you have th that much power? And obviously save time, no one likes to sit idle and wait for the threads to complete. So multi-threading in C++. So before looking at the uh, multi-threading in Python, let's have a look at the actual multi-threading in C++. A little bit of uh, code I'll I hope that's visible. So that's a little bit of, uh, actually that is C++. Quite ironic that uh, its name is C-Threads. So uh, I'm using the pthreads library, it's in the standard library. And I have defined a function called as task. <laughs> I don't need Java, I'm using C++. So there's a function called as task, which uh, does nothing but a for loop. It takes n as an input and uh, uh, runs the for loop till n. That's it. That's a very trivial program. Now I have uh, defined a variable called as n, and I want to loop through throughout the n. I have assigned some memory to it, and uh, here I'm using a clock to time my execution. And here I'm calling the uh, task. So I have defined the begin here, right? The time when I start this, and now I'll uh, run this task and I'll see how much it, time it takes for a single thread. Now we have a couple of threads here using pthread. I'm not very good at C, so if I make some mistakes, so don't judge me on that. So this is, I'm again resetting this variable begin. And this is p create, thread create, so there are a couple of uh, threads I'm spawning, and I'm assigning half of the task to each. So this arg is basically n by two, which is defined here. So basically I'm uh, assigning the whole task n to a single thread and timing its execution and then assigning the task to two threads by n by two and seeing what uh, how much time both of them takes. And then finally I'll print for the elapsed time elapsed with two threads here. So let's run it. I'm compiling, uh, so this code is in the uh, GitHub repository which I linked earlier. So I'm just uh, compile it. Now I'll run it. So you can see the time elapsed with one thread is like 0 0.2, uh, it's actually milliseconds, so 0 0.2 milliseconds. And uh, with two threads, it's almost the half, very close to half. So uh, that's how multi-threading looks like in C++. And that's what you expect uh, in a general programming language. Now let's see multithreading in Python. So let's talk a bit about the API, how the API looks like in Python, how you are going to proceed with multithreading. A bit of documentation here, basically. So uh, Python has got this threading module, and which has got this thread class. So if you want to define a class in thread, so this is how you'll do it. That run function is basically where you will write your execution code, which you want when this thread runs. And there's another way, which is functions as thread. If you like functions, then you can write a function and then pass it as a target to the threading.thread class. And args is basically the arguments to that function. And t1.start will start that thread. Okay, yep, let's see an example. So there was a, if you're really interested in gills, then you, you might want to see David Giesley's uh, presentation on this after this talk. So I guess more of, most of you would have seen it. So this example is taken from his uh, presentation. So this is a very trivial example of uh, running threads. So I've got this countdown function, which uh, does nothing, just uh, executes for loop. And I'm doing the total work through it. And uh, it's run since we'll see the performance of it. Now I'm dividing the work in two threads and see how much time it takes. So basically, uh, yep, let's see. 
So obviously, uh, you would expect that the uh, work would be divided between threads and they would proceed uh, together and the time taken would be less than the single thread. But this is what actually happens. So in a single thread, it takes 0.63 seconds. And in, a, in two threads running parallel, it takes 0.9 seconds, which is more than single thread, which is not what you expect in, in a general la farming language, which have the multi-threading support. So that's the analogy that uh, two people doing the same work would be faster than single people, but that's not how it works. So let's talk about GIL now. So GIL stands for the Global Interpreter Lock. Basically, GIL ensures that only one thread can run, uh, take the interpreter at one point of time. So that's how the, the summary of GIL. So at any time, uh, any, any number of threads are forced to wait, and only one thread will complete the execution or run in the execution. So whenever, th so basically, it's nothing but a variable in uh, Python C eval dot h, which is uh, if you could see. So recently, Python uh, put the uh, uh, its source code in GitHub, which were earlier in Mercurial, I guess. So it's quite easier and to see. So you can see the file C eval dot h, where you can see it's just a simple lock uh, variable. So let's uh, define a couple of processes first. So IO one IO one process are basically the processes which spend uh, most of the time doing I.O., like socket and networks, uh, and uh, like reading from the file and stuff like that. And there's another called as CPU bound, which does most of the like, arithmetic stuff, calculations, and stuff like that. So for I.O. bound uh, thread, so GIL is released on a blocking I.O. So for example, if uh, let's say you are using the request library to uh, fetch the source code of, let's say, google.com. So it, so you'll send the request to the server, and uh, what will happen is the, re the response would not be like the instantaneous, in instantaneous. So you'll have to wait for it. So at this point of time, you're doing nothing, right? So at that point of time, the GIL is released for, for IO1 process, and it will wait for the uh, uh, for the response to come, and then later on it can grab the GIL and uh, show you the show you the response. So that's the reason you can like have hundreds of threads doing the same task, and all of them can wait together. So that's how I want uh, process benefit from the multi-threading in Python. So how it used to work in, uh, so basically, you can see that the pi, uh, there's a fight for GIL. Like, there are a lot of threads waiting for the GIL, because everyone wants to complete the execution, and there's a fight. So who will win the fight? So what's the rule for uh, getting the GIL? So this is the rule for getting the GIL before Python 3.2. So it be, uh, whenever a uh, thread acquires the GIL, uh, the interpreter have a check for like 100 ticks. So what tick is basically is a roughly a Python bytecode operation. And uh, ticks are basically the smallest uh, opcode thing. And uh, we cannot uh, interrupt them. So if it starts the execution, it has to end. And uh, yep, so for example, so the thing is, ticks can be as small as like a couple of nanoseconds. and as large as maybe a fraction of seconds. So for example, you can see the example in like x in range 10 to the power 6. Depending on the system, it can take maybe a second, I guess. And you can have a statement like uh, none is none. It will take less than a nanosecond. So that's how the tick is defined. So it's very roughly defined and very crude idea. That's why it's not a very good idea. Why Gil? So why the heck you have GIL? Because uh, even the GIL is not for any good. The reason behind the GIL is like it made the implementation of the interpreter very simple and very easy to reason about things. And uh, it's easy to write C extensions. One of the major reasons for the popularity of Python in the 90s was the ease of writing C extensions. And it's uh, quite easy to write C extensions in Python, even as of now. And since you have just one global lock, so you don't have deadlocks. That's one of the advantage. And as you have seen, that uh, it works great for IO bound processes, because, uh, it's, because most of the time it is waiting, and a uh, lot of people can wait together, not having the GIL. So let's dive into why this, uh, why this idea came out. So for that, let's see how the memory management in Python looks like. So Python uses this something called as reference counting, which is basically uh, an object is there. When you define an object, it has a reference count that how many references that object has. And when you like have multiple instances of it, the reference increases by one every time you create a new instance. 
And you can actually check this with the sys.getRef count. So let's see a quick example. So you can see that the reference, so you can, uh, sys.getRef count is the method which from which you can get the reference. I hope it's visible. So the reason why you're seeing two here, in, even though there's only one instance, is because when you pass that A into that sys.getRef count, that count increased by one. And if I do like this, it should be okay. <laughs> mm, that's not what I expect. <laughs> okay, it, I think it forgot count, counting. So let's skip it. I don't know what's hap what's happening here. But it should be increased by one only. Maybe something wrong happened. I don't know. So reference counting, as I told you. So because uh, see. The uh, Python's interpreter is written in C, so you have uh, these reference counting things work in C. So that's how the uh, execution works. So, th so these are the functions used for uh, uh, increasing the reference count and decreasing the reference count. So pi inc ref is for increasing the reference count, and pi dec ref is for increasing the decreasing the reference count. So let's see an example of reference counting with threads. This example is inspired from Larry Hastings, uh, uh, Larry Hastings' uh, presentation on uh, Gale. So this is, uh, now we have an object in the middle, and uh, we have a couple of threads running. So, and the reference count at this point of time is two. And both of the threads wants to decrease the reference count. Let's say thread one is like uh, dealing with the object, and it wants to delete an instance of the ob object. And thread two also wants to delete an instance of the object. right? And it's not an atomic uh, process because uh, when you want to decrease it, so AX is basically a register. We are going deep into the hardware. So AX is a register which is used for uh, this arithmetic arithmetic thing. So when you do this uh, minus one or plus one, it's a three-step process. It first loads into the AX register, decreases its value, and then saves back to the memory address. So currently the reference count is two. The third one reads it, and it reads it correct correctly. That is two. And it decreases it by one and saves it into the memory address. Now thread two reads it, it reads it correctly. It decreases it by one and saves it into the memory and it saves it correct. So because we had the reference count as two earlier and both of them tried decreasing the reference count by one. So the reference count should be zero as it is right now. Let's see your race condition. Now thread one reads it as two, which it should be. Thread 2 reads at 2 as well at this point of time. Now thread 1 decreases it, thread 2 decreases it, thread 1 saves it, and thread 2 saves it. Now you're stuck up. At Ideally, at this point of time, the object should have been deleted from the memory, but it's not. So here is a memory leak. That's why you have that gil, one of the reasons why you have gil. So now the question arises that uh, I have got 36 cores and I'm using Python, how do I use it? So what are the alternative approaches for that? So one thing you can do is you can have process-based concurrency. So apart from the multi-threading module in Python, you also have multi-processing module. So multi-process is basically you can have spawn multiple processes as we saw in the initial slide and process is completely independent. So it does not share any memory. So you can see processes as different Python programs spawned by a parent. So you can see that they, all of them are running their own version of Python. And so all of them have their, their own gil. So all of them can run parallelly. And if you have 36 cores, you can run 36 processes at one time. Even more than that, but at one point of time, only 36 will run. And there's something called as C extensions, which I talked earlier. So you can write C extensions. So this problem of gil is with the Python interpreter. So as long as you're not interacting with the Python's interpreter, you can raise the gil and you can have true parallelism. 
So what you can do is so you can write some code in C, that is uh, C or C++, and uh, you can call that. So basically, if you have something like CP bound process, you can write in C and interact that, uh, uh, call that function from Python. So we'll see that example. Another way is Cython. So Cython is very similar to Python with some type casting, and you can there's a there's a with statement with statement call as with no gil. And of course, you should not be interacting with Python inter interpreter at that point of time. Otherwise, it will not release the gil. So C extensions is one of the example I'll, I'm going to show. So this is what happens. So uh, when you release the gil, save the state of the thread in the local variable, release the gil, do some work, and then grab the gil again. So for doing these, there's a couple of there are a couple of macros in. Uh, so basically, Python has a C API. So it's not like you'll write any C code and you can call it in Python. You need to follow the API. So there's something called as Python.h you need to import. So that defines how you how you can define methods and functions and call them in Python. So that's how it works. So these are the two macros which are defined in Python.h. And uh, when you surround a code uh, by these two macros, then you can actually uh, then then you can actually release the gil, right? And obviously, uh, if you try to interact with the Python interpreter in between, then you are in no luck. So you cannot release the gil by in that point of time. So you need to be very smart even you, by using this. It's not like you can do anything with this. So let's see an example. So I've written a C extension, a very simple C, ex uh, C extension. So this hash include python.h. You need to uh, install python dev. Python dev or devil, I think, to get this python.h. Otherwise, you'll get some crazy errors. So this is my definition. So you saw that I was uh, using that function called as count, and uh, it could not run truly parallel. So what I have done is I have defined that count function in a C extension. So this is that count function. And it accepts a Python object because this function would be called from Python, so it should expect a Python object. And uh, I'm defining a variable, a very long, long, so that I can test it with like huge uh, integer. And I'm parsing that variable as long. And if I fail to parse it, if it's not a proper Python object, then it will return null, so that it raises an error. So here what I'm doing is I'm using that uh, macro, the pi begin allow threads and pi end allow threads. And you can see all I'm doing in this code is uh, simply going through the loop that value times. So whatever the n is, it will execute the loop. And it does nothing uh, with the Python interpreter. It does not uh, create a Python object. Like you can see, if I do something like pi build value. So uh, after this has finished, so you will return pi build value is basically a Python object. It will return a Python object that is uh, integer, that is one. So if I do something like that here, then this, these macros won't work. So this is pure C, and there's no Python interaction in between those macros. So that's why that's why it works. So now they have a, a protocol for defining functions in the module. So you can see I've defined count. That is count is the part of this module, and I'm, I have defined the module itself. It is it would be called as extensions module, and I have initialized the module. That is the extensions module. So now I can call this uh, extensions module in my Python code. So let's see that Python code which does that. OK, so this is the Python code here. And I'm importing from Python C extension. This is basically a directory structure that nothing else. And here is the extensions module, import count. So before that, obviously, that is C, so I need to build it first. So let's build it first. And uh, there's also, so. Uh, apart from like you have you have to create a make file for building this you can also use distutils it's it has got a nice api to building across platforms so i've created a setup.py so here it looks like it's quite simple so that's how i'll build it so that's built and it's in the build directory here itself
okay let's copy everything from the build directory to the uh, python c extension For some reasons, it's not able to find the <laughs> Okay Yep, it's ah, yep, you're right. Thank you. So I need to define this variable here Yes, now you can see that uh, we have achieved parallelism through Python, but not exactly Python, uh, using C. So you can see the time taken by a single thread is almost two seconds. And uh, for two threads, it's one second. And apart from that, so the reason I have used uh, volatile here, so why I have used volatile is because I have was I was having hard time getting this uh, benchmark because the C was the C plus plus was so fast that it used to be always faster in single thread because it was like taking like very nanoseconds. But the reason was because uh, the compiler these days are very advanced and it does very amazing optimizations because the, you can see the loop is empty, so it can do some optimizations and see that there's nothing, so you can pass in it. So that's why. I used volatile keywords. That is basically um, that basically means that this uh, this variable should not be tampered with with no uh, optimizations. That's why I'm able to show this one second and two second. So let's get back to the presentation. Yep. Uh, so let's see some visualizations. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is through threading in Python, and I yep, and that is through the count method I used earlier. You can see the blue one is a single thread and the orange one orange one is the multi thread all of them are almost same but run on different machines i don't remember the machines and this is with c extensions you can see the multi thread is better now it takes less time so what gilio has to say on gil is basically uh, if you want to proceed by removing gil which is like uh, impossible almost an impossible task there are two conditions you need to fulfill that it should not destroy the performance of single thread applications and the io bound application should be as fast as it is right now which is a very tough benchmark to achieve so there have been an attempt to remove gil earlier so there was a patch by greg in 90s in which he tried to remove the gil and he moved the uh, he moved into a per thread data structure to have uh, multiple threads running in a parallel. So patch introduces a global reference counting mutex lock. Basically, so you have seen the reference counting was one of the main culprits uh, of uh, the gil. So he had a mutex lock around the reference counting. And uh, the built-ins like list and dix have their own locks to have synchronous uh, modifications. But the patch was uh, made the performance of single thread as uh, so bad that uh, it could not be accepted. But it was a good work, but it's a good to see that work and analyze how the approach was. And uh, as I told you that it was earlier a based system and in 3.2 we instituted the new, new guild by Anton Petro. So what it is basically. So earlier it was text based, now it is time based. Now you have the, you can set the time for 
thread switching so that you don't a uh, uh, thread does not starve for so long for, so what happens uh, in actually is basically a thread is uh, like executing and if other thread is waiting for it so it can wait for 100 byte codes but after e even if after it waits for 100 byte codes there is no guarantee that that will get it the other thread will get it it can be the case that the same thread goes on continuing so on so in the new one it forces the thread to raise it and the other reason is basically the having the 100 byte codes is a very crude idea like as i told you that byte codes can be of uh, as simple as like a uh, couple of nanoseconds and it can be as like a second a quarter second so that is a very crude idea and so if you have like something like uh, very large byte codes like 100 byte codes like it can take forever to release the gil so now it's more predictable that's why that's the biggest uh, benefit and if you want to read more about it then these are some of the links that's it. Okay. Um, thank you, Amit. Um, yep. We already are in a coffee break. And uh, uh, questions? Uh, just a quick one. Is it safe to create new threads while you don't have the gill? Or does that conflict with assumptions that the Python interpreter has? Say so again, if, uh, is it safe to? Is it, is it safe to create new threads, start new threads while you don't have the gil? But you don't have the gil? Yes, you gave it away. And then you start threads. You mean the gil is not there in the Python and you start threads? No, you were called, then you set up your stuff and then returned the lock. And then you start new threads. Is that safe? Uh, do you mean, uh, I'm not able to understand your question, is it like two threads running exactly parallel? Yeah, or more. I don't think that is possible because uh, one always has to acquire the gil. Any more questions? Nope. So, thanks again, Amit.